Our gospel reading this morning is from the book of John, uh, chapter twenty-four, chapter seventeen, verses eleven through nineteen, and these are on page one eleven of the New Testament. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to them. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not not asking you to, to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they may also be sanctified in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Appreciate your help. Thank you for reading for us today. <clears throat> when Amy and I moved into our house in Oro Valley in 2019, one of the first things we did, and I think I've shared something about this story before, well, at least you know what we did, was place bird feeders in our yard, right in our backyard. The result of doing so still continues to teach us so much about nature. The season we are in right now, spring, is always our favorite for bird watching. And our favorite birds to watch are the gambles quail. Each season, they come walking in in adult pairs to our feeders where they eat and then depart for their carefully hidden nests that are nearby to our house, and sometimes as far away as the wash. We've noticed that Gamble's quail are excellent with camouflage, and for a good reason. Gamble's quail are grounded birds who rarely fly above a few feet, meaning that they have to be good at providing cover for themselves and for their hatchlings. A few weeks from today, the parents and their newborn hatchlings will begin their march to our feeders, where the parents will, and we've seen it happen, will teach them how to feed, and more importantly, will teach them how to hide. This is a time fraught with danger for the chicks because they start walking not long after they hatch. They get, you know, they don't stay in the nest and then get pushed out. They go. And that makes them, of course, vulnerable to predators. In fact, only about 15% of quail chicks survive to adulthood after they hatch. The daily procession of the quail families begins with sometimes as many as 12 hatchlings. But as the weeks go by, Amy and I see the lessening number until there are only two or three juveniles coming to the feeders. Though we know It is a part of nature, you know, what Disney called the circle of life, right? We cannot help but feel sadness for the chicks, but especially for their parents 
who struggle, really fight, to protect them. Our feeders are surrounded by bushes, which provide cover for the quail while they are feeding. Yet, no matter how much cover the parents can find, it just doesn't prevent predators from reducing the size of the covey. It's going to happen. The struggle, it, that image kind of came to my mind, the struggle of the quail to protect their young. It reminded me of Jesus' remarkable prayer for the protection of his disciples in those hours just before his arrest, a prayer which we only find in John's version of the Lord's Supper. The events in the upper room take up five, five of the 21 chapters in John's Gospel, beginning, as you'll recall, with the washing of the disciples' feet, followed by Jesus' confrontation with Judas. After Judas departed, Jesus spoke to his disciples about what was going to happen, both to him and to them in the hours and days to come. You see, I think that when Judas left, Jesus knew they could remember he urged Judas. He gave Judas every opportunity not to do this. But Judas went and then Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what was going to happen at that moment. He might have been expecting the kind of thing that was going to happen at some point, but when Judas left, he knew that he was going to be betrayed. So Judas leaves, and Jesus spoke to his disciples. Jesus assured his disciples that with his death, their salvation would be secured. But he also told them that in the coming hours, they would be scattered from him and from each other. Jesus then openly prayed in the presence of his followers. Jesus' prayer in John is sometimes called the shepherd's prayer because in that prayer, we hear the voice of the good shepherd praying for a flock that is about to be attacked and scattered. In the first part of Jesus' prayer, Jesus said that in his life, he had glorified the Father. Jesus then asked for his Father to glorify him in the hours to come. In the second part, Jesus thanked the Father for the gift of his disciples, saying that he was now praying specifically for them and not for the world. Then comes our passage for this morning, when the disciples heard the content of Jesus' prayer for their protection. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. This part of the prayer exemplifies a major theme in the Gospels that I think is overlooked. That theme is how Jesus struggled, struggled like a loving parent to protect his followers from those who sought to dishearten them, <laughs> frighten them, scatter them, or destroy them. Often, Jesus' detractors did not openly criticize Jesus face to face, not just in John, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They confronted the apostles instead. 
When the Pharisees attacked Jesus for breaking the Sabbath laws or attacked him for dining with tax collectors and sinners, they complained to the apostles and the disciples first. First. When the religious leaders denounced Jesus for forgiving sins, they denounced him first to his followers, sowing the seeds of doubt. And fear. Every time the disciples were afraid, no matter the reason, Jesus found a way to calm their fears. Remember the storm on the lake. That's an example. Every time Jesus' followers were challenged or threatened, Jesus placed himself between them and those who were attacking them. He stepped out and placed himself between them. Knowing this, it is easy to understand Jesus' prayer in light of the great anxiety that Peter and the others must have felt that evening. But in this prayer for their protection, Jesus also promised in his prayer that after the scattering, the disciples' fear would transform into joy. This is what he asked of the Father. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they, his followers, may have my joy made complete in themselves. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. I want to give you a side note on that. When you say the Lord's Prayer and we say, deliver us from evil, you're actually saying, deliver us from the evil one. The same word used here for evil one, Jesus used in the Lord's Prayer. However, it, the evil one was taken off to make a generality of evil uh, in the Lord's Prayer. But it was, it is translated, at least in the Aramaic, in the Greek, as evil one. He went on, they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Just before his prayer, Jesus promised his disciples he would return to make their joy complete. The joy which the apostles had anticipated was the triumph they expected when Jesus would claim the messianic throne of Israel. But that is not the joy which Jesus promised. At least that's not what we hear in this prayer. Instead, Jesus' prayer spoke of a transcendent joy. A joy not dependent on anything in this world. Jesus knew the struggle that all of his followers would face after his resurrection, after his ascension the struggle to keep his word, the struggle to obey his commands, the struggle to hold on to faith and not lose heart. He knew this, that over the centuries to come, this, these struggles would continue. The struggle to be the church in a world under the power of evil, or if you wish, the evil one. But Jesus also wanted his disciples to grasp the joy of their faith and the peace, the peace that would come with that joy. An inner peace, a peace that defied worldly understanding. Jesus concluded his prayer with a final request that God would consecrate these disciples. Jesus said, Sanctify them in the truth, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. The word sanctify means set apart, which also is the meaning of consecrate. While the word consecrate is not a word, we hear very often. 
people are consecrated all the time for different reasons. The sanctification, which is a unique take on consecration, the sanctification for which Jesus prays is a spiritual consecration. That is literally the meaning of sanctification, a spiritual setting apart. And it represented Jesus' own willingness, own willingness to be set apart for God. Jesus' prayer acknowledges that he is also setting himself apart for us in the events that will take place in the hours to come. As Jesus set himself apart for the sake of love, Jesus prayed to the Father to also set his followers apart for the sake of love. God answered Jesus' prayer three days later in the resurrection of Christ. Then God answered the prayer of his Son in the calling and setting apart of those who would become his disciples then and now so that we may live without fear for our lives and for our souls, so that our faith will always, always be protected. You and I can live this life of faith because Jesus lived with us in the flesh, even as we now live with Christ in the Spirit. This morning, Jesus covers us with his grace and presence in order that we might cover the world with the good news of God's love. We can face our fears, we can endure our griefs, and we can be joyful because we are protected by a love that never fails, that never ends, that never turns away from us no matter what we don't have to be good children because we can't be good children but Christ was and we belong to Christ who reckons us as good children Psalm 91 makes this promise and in it I hear the echoes of the mother birds. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, he will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings, you, we, will find refuge. Amen.